briefly be talking about, as I had mentioned in my abstract, about two post-colonial writers and scholars, their views on the question of language and colonial languages. So one is uh, Ngugi Tiango from, of course, um, Kenya, and the other, Franz Fanon, originally from Martinique, but his adopted country was Algeria, so I consider him an Algerian. <clears throat> so uh, when you read, especially, uh, I'll start with Fanon. Uh, in The Wretched of the Earth, there is a chapter which is part of one of his speeches on nationalism. And he's arguing there that instead of creating a United States of Africa, which Sinor and all the other negritude movement people wanted, uh, he was suggesting that it's essential for African nations to first develop national identities and then build on that to build transnational identities. And he articulates the three stages of native writing. And the first stage that he talks about is when the natives, they learn their master's languages and they try to write as good as their masters. They try to prove to them that I can learn French as good as you and I can write in it or English or whichever language. And they work with the colonial materials, the colonial art forms and the, the, the styles of writing from the colonies. Um, can you not hear me? Can you hear me? Okay, good, thank you. Okay, okay, thank you. And so uh, in the second stage, what he suggests is what Fanon suggests is that the native writers and artists, they start working with native materials. They, they go and discover the native art forms, the native forms of poetry, and then start working with that as a way of adopting their own native culture. And then in the third stage, they start writing revolutionary literature, start producing revolutionary art, which in Fanon's words, uh, speak, they write a sentence that speaks the heart of the people. And so I'll briefly stop there on Fanon because there's a lot to unpack, but then when we go to Ngugi Tiango uh, in his book Decolonizing the Mind, uh, what he's talking about is, is the role that language plays, right? And he then also explains that there are three functions of language, right? One, it is the way we understand the given mode of production, like we understand who does what in the world. It is a mode of communication because it's a shared code. If I know Yaruba, you know Yaruba, we can talk to each other. But the third and the most important function of the language that he talks about is that language is a carrier of culture from one generation to another, okay? And that is what he considers the most significant role of language. And there is something which he's arguing for. So if you look at most of Africa, uh, the African cultures had not yet developed their orthography. And so they first get overwritten by the Arab culture, the Arabic, and then, of course, by the European cultures. And what happens with oral traditions and oral customs is that if, if you miss it in one or two generations, since knowledge is passed orally from one generation to another, chances are that you can completely wipe that knowledge out, right? And so that's why Ngugi, in his work, constantly suggests that native writers of Africa should write in their native languages. I mean, they, sh they should write in English and French as well, but it's important for them to write in their native languages so that they can preserve the culture and keep building on it. 
Now, this problem was really peculiar in colonization of Africa because the languages were oral, the traditions were oral. It wasn't so acutely present in the subcontinent because we already had highly developed linguistic traditions, highly developed literary traditions, all the way from Farsi, Urdu, Sanskrit, Hindi, Tamil, Malayalam, all these languages already had written scripts, Punjabi. And then there were literatures being produced in them, literatures being consumed in them. But there is another thing that Ungugi talks about, and that is the colonial educational process. What does it do to the psyche of the natives, right? And he gives us an example of an average colonial school Right? where little kids from small villages, every day they go to the school, and where they are taught different subjects, right? But they are also taught the colonial languages, English, French. But they are not just taught the language. In the process of learning that language, they also internalize this idea that this is the language of power. If I learn it, I can move upward. The upward mobility is connected to acquiring the colonial language. But there is even something more sinister that happens in the school system, and that is that in most Kenyan uh, government-run schools, students were not allowed to speak in native languages, in Gikuyu or Yoruba or other native languages. And if you spoke in native, native languages, you were publicly shamed and you were punished. And the way the teacher would catch you is that the first thing in the morning when the teacher walked into a classroom, they will give a student a little token, right? And they will tell them, pass it on to the next kid who speaks Yoruba. And so the kids will keep passing it on to each other, and by the end of the school day, the teacher would ask who has the token, and the person who had it and the teacher will follow the chain, and then all the 10, 12 kids who spoke Yoruba would be publicly humiliated and punished. So what that forced these kids to internalize wasn't only that, French, that English was a superior language and they needed to learn it, but that using their own language was somehow a shameful thing to do. And so that develops that disdain. If you develop a disdain for your own language, chances are since language encompasses culture, there is no culture without language, then you will start looking down at your own culture as well. And so think of it this way. I mean, you all live in Pakistan, and you are like in one of the privileged cities of Pakistan, Lahore, right? Um, most Pakistanis only want to live either in Islamabad, Lahore, or Karachi, right? <laughs> so think of the strata that you deal with, the class strata. You still probably have people who make fun of others because their English accent is too Pendu, right? You still probably judge people from where they got their degrees. Oh, ye chisan ka pada hai. There is a class system, linguistic class system, in which the English abilities or how you speak, how you conduct yourself, uh, decides for certain people, especially the bourgeois middle class people, your value as a human being. And that is a colonial legacy, right? It's a colonial mindset that says, these, these institutions are privileged, and those who come from them are better somehow than those who come from Narawal and, you know, Gujar Khan, right? That's, that's a, a mindset. That's a colonial mindset. And it's deeply embedded in Indian culture, in Pakistani culture, and it, it is deeply embedded in what we consider the intellectual culture of Pakistan. So what is the response to it? Of course, the response cannot be we'll become purist and uh, renounce English. After all, I'm speaking to you in English. And then just go and speak in Punjabi and Pashto. I don't think so that's a solution. 
I think being aware of this, our own state of mind, our own prejudices and biases about what we privilege and how we privilege it in opposition to our native cultures and our native languages, being aware of that, I think, is important. Um, and keeping in mind that, you know, yeah, it's a language of our former colonizers, fine. You know, they may probably overrode some of our sensitivities, but maybe there are certain things that we believe in and talk about. Maybe we need to dislodge them too. But how do we dislodge this privileging of a mindset where English automatically, somehow, if you can speak it better, if you can write in it better, somehow you are superior, you are better? I mean, the question there is, how do we do that, right, as professors of literature, as professors of linguistic? Um, I mean, that's the question that you all have to answer, right, because you, you practice there, you teach there. And part of it would be, uh, you know, by, by somewhat placing the native languages, giving them equal importance, right, by not suggesting that English somehow is inherently superior, I absolutely don't buy into that. You know, I have read all of English poetry, you know, starting from the classics, you know, John Donne, Shakespeare, Ben Jonson, everyone, contemporary poets, right? There is not even a single verse in English poetry that can move me the way, you know, Faz Ahmed Faz moves me, right? Or Iqbal somewhat, even though he's too pedantic for me. But... But, but the idea is that, that there is that power in native languages. There is that wisdom in our poetry. And maybe if we could valorize it a little, if maybe if the Urdu departments weren't just in that small corner of a university with people still just talking about Ajmaliyat and, you know, talking about how, like, a verse can be read in a 30 different ways, maybe if they got politically engaged in the world, Right, taught poetry and fiction as if it matters in the world, and maybe that would enable it. And by the way, I don't consider Urdu a native language of Pakistan. It's a language of two and a half percent of Pakistani population. There are probably more native Pashto speakers in Pakistan than Urdu speakers, but it is a national language. Every nation sort of needs one because it helps communication. So in that sense, I think it is useful. But one cautionary note that I have is, is that in the process of, let's say, dislodging English from its privileged location or privileged place, uh, don't become nativists. Don't just say that we absolutely don't need it. We can translate everything in Urdu. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. All we need to do is to remind ourselves constantly that simply because we teach English and use English and do research in it, doesn't necessarily mean that it is a superior language, or if I can express myself in English somehow, I become a superior person. But that prejudice is there, I mean, and you can correct me if, if I'm wrong. And I think part of the project of linguistic departments and also literature departments is to, to unlearn that privilege and to undo it and then see you know, what, how to make it a little more hybrid, how to make it a little more egalitarian, right? How to look at our own class biases and, uh, and then figure out where do they come from? I mean, can you imagine in Islamabad there are people who basically will charge you a lot of money and they do accent training. Do you know how out of place it sounds when someone is standing in Pakistan and speaking in a purely high British accent? I mean, I have nothing against people who were born in England and their parents moved back and they brought their accent with them. But other than that, it absolutely sounds out of place. But we correct people. You know, we're like, this is wall. It's not wall, right? It's tall. It's not tall. What difference does it make, you know, whether I say tall or tall, right, as long as I can convey my meaning and convey my sense? And it's that 
bourgeois liberal way of privileging not just the language of England, but its particular accents and its cultural associations with, with high class and low class, I think which is problematic and which needs to be dislodged. Um, I have friends, you know, who, who want to propose other languages like Arabic, you know. I mean, Arabic is not also our language, you know, it's the language of the Arabs. Last I checked, not a lot of us had that Arab heritage. Maybe we are closer to the Iranians. Maybe Farsi should be the language, you know, which is, you know, language of paradise anyway, uh, which we should be privileging. But these are some of my rough thoughts on this subject. And uh, I think about it a lot, and I actually write about it too. Uh, but I'm not going to bore you to death. Uh, I hope that... Uh, you have some questions. I mean, the question that I want to leave you with is that as practitioners in Pakistan of literature and linguistics and pedagogy, how would you go about making your students more aware of it, of this bias where they privilege the English language or native languages? But in your curriculum and classrooms, how would you undo that, that people may still learn the English language and work in it, but don't get caught up in thinking that simply because they can string two sentences in English, they are somehow superior to others. How to undo that kind of internalized bias against the native languages? And that's a question that you know you all have to answer. And uh, particularly, I've lived in all provinces of Pakistan. Um, the Punjabis are the worst. Punjabi ko thodi si tanha milni shuru hoti hai, nokri achhi lag jati hai. First thing that they abandon is their own language. I mean, like, they would sometimes feel ashamed of using their own languages, especially the middle class bourgeois Punjabis. You will never see that in Sindh. You will never see that in Balochistan. You will never see that in KPK. You know, uh, Pathans can be nuclear scientists or whatever. The moment two of them meet, right? they will always speak in, in Pashto. Same for Bravi-speaking people, Balochi and Sindh. Same in Sindh, right? Somehow there is something, maybe it's because Punjab usually had a larger urban class and they were more incorporated with the project of the empire and, uh, and, and they have a higher middle class. Maybe it's, it's a, but these are some of my thoughts about it. Exactly must be the behavior of a teacher of English language in class with teaching, teaching good and correct accent. I don't know what the behavior should be. I won't worry about accent. I mean, it's not your native language. You're not in Yorkshire. You're not in Oxford. You are in Pakistan, right? I've lived in the United States for 25 years. I've never tried to clean up my accent. This is the accent that I brought from Pakistan. I have worked on it a little bit because I've internalized certain Americanisms. But I think the teachers shouldn't worry about accent. They should worry about whether a student can write eloquently and express themselves in this language or not. Beyond that, I mean, Urdu is not, not my native language. I have an accent in Urdu. How many times have you sat down and worried about making your accent more nostalgic, right, or better? Not, not many times, so why should we worry about English? Um, So how to make our students fluent in speaking if we are not focusing on only speaking English? Well, you can make them fluent. What I'm trying to say is that don't let them internalize this idea that somehow, by since they are able to speak English, they are superior to others. Or if someone speaks in an accent, Punjabi, Pashto, or Balochi accent in English, there is nothing wrong with it. That is the subtle thing I would like to, you know, incorporate in my teaching, uh, and and not associate any class biases with that. And you guys know what I'm talking about. I mean, these people are around you probably still, 
um, you know, pointing out these things to students like, you know, ye pendu hai, to is, iska leja jo hai, Punjabi leja mein Angrezi bolta hai. We, we used to tell jokes about these when we were young. And that's what I'm talking about. As far as learning a language, absolutely, you can learn a language, still have an accent in it, still produce good work in it, still know its subtleties, how it works, still read a complex text and understand it. Be my guest, you know, master it, right? That I have no problem with that. I think we shouldn't worry about the accent. We should just focus on our students' ability to convey themselves and to explain complex ideas and talk about them, right? It doesn't matter. I mean, yeah, okay, the grammatically they should learn how to mm, grammatically speak or at least write correctly, but accent shouldn't be any of our worries. But also, it, you know, the ability to speak English, we still know that it's useful in Pakistan. English is still a language of power. And that would be a dislodging, where you, we basically say, yeah, fine. I mean, right now, if, if you take the civil services exam, um, you know, if you don't know good English, chances are you'll fail the exam or fail the interview, right? because we have made a system in which we expect our civil servants to, to, to speak impeccable English, which is okay. I mean, they should, but it shouldn't be a requirement. And then where does that system of civil servants come from? It's, it's the legacy that the British left us, right? These deputy commissioners and all. Uh, it's the same system that we implemented. We have never tried to change it. Uh, they don't represent the people. Right? but they lord over people and they don't even consider themselves servants of the people. It goes with that mindset of a class mindset where these people feel they are superior to everyday people, right? people who pay their salaries, basically. Same is the case with Pakistan Army. You know, I was an army officer. We had this inflated idea of we were better than everyone else. Of course we were better than everyone else. We didn't have to worry about everyday things. We didn't have to worry about our electric bill and gas meter and going and buying rations, right? Most of our needs were taken care of. And so when you have such a privileged life, you can aff afford to be focused on your job and things like that. Um, Sir, if we as teachers shun inferiority complex as non-natives, we can be as natural as is possible. Absolutely. But, I mean, try to understand the nature of where the inferiority complex comes from. I mean, we don't wake up with an inferiority complex, right? Uh, it's not natural, right? It comes from a consciousness of your class, how you are viewed, right? Uh, how others view you, do they recognize you or not? So as a teacher, sometimes just recognizing a student's value, you know, and, and respecting them will be more than enough to stabilize their identity. And I'm into like a different field of pedagogy now, but uh, this, think of it this way, how easy it is in Pakistan for a professor to just stand you up and just embarrass you in front of a whole class, right? You can't think of doing that in America. Not because you will get fired, but because it is considered unprofessional, it is considered insensitive. If we have to say something to a student, you know, we'll tell them, I would like to see you in my office. And then we can tell them, hey, what you did in class today was disruptive. It was wrong. But we will never shame a student, even if they have given us the stupidest of all the answers, because that is destructive as, as a pedagogical practice. Uh, so if you are a teacher, ask yourself, have you been guilty of that, right? If you have, just don't do it, right? Um, we don't have to learn kindness and generosity from the British or the French or for the American. I mean, this used to be the value of our own culture. So maybe those are the values that we need to retrieve, you know, be kind, be generous, right? be soft. Yeah, we, we change this mindset through influencing our new generations. 
But that would depend on what kind of education are we giving them. Okay, in the last 20 years, Pakistan probably has built more universities than anyone else. When I left Pakistan, there was no Rifa University, right? Now every, you know, you go to a mall and there is a university. Part of it is because it's a money-making business. You know, you, you, you build a university, you charge the fees, you don't pay the teachers much, you don't have a tenure system, you don't have long-term contracts, you just hire a professor, your lecturers cheaply build a curriculum. If you know someone in HEC, you get the university approved, and there you go. So first of all, the teachers are not fully trained or respected. They are overworked and underpaid, right? Then well, the kind of education we are focusing on is STEM education, engineering, computer sciences, MBAs. Fine, that is great. We need that. But what changes attitudes, what teaches people how to act responsibly, be generous and kind, is the humanistic education. It's the role of the humanities to do that, but not simply by reading good novels. The humanists, the teachers who teach humanities, need to incorporate in their teaching practices the values of humanity, not just Shakespeare ke char play parlo and you'll be fine. No, that, that serves no purpose. It has no value in the world. But if we ask them to read texts and see how they feel about them, why do they, how are women being treated in this novel? If you are a guy, do you feel bad about it? So chances are the, the male student, just to get an A in your class, would perform empathy. And, and scientific research has shown us that when people perform empathy just to like prove to others that they, they can, it, it rewires their brains, right? So in order for your education to really impact students' minds, their consciousness, and their way of looking at the world, you yourself as teachers have to train yourself about what is effective pedagogy. How do you do that? Uh, I mean, if I could show you my shelf on the left, you know, there are about 50 books on this shelf that are all about critical pedagogy. That is me trying to seek, how can I do this better? You know, thinking about it, reading about it, talking to people in the field about it. And that's how much it would take if you want to make an impact, right? If you just want a paycheck and, you know, have a solid job and, you know, buy a house and a car, then your priorities are different. There is nothing wrong with that, right? We live in a world we need things. But if you're a committed pedagogue, then you have to focus on these things. You have to train yourself. Um, is the language, does the language determine the social class? I think, yes, it does. In, in, in the former colonies, it does. People who can speak the colonial languages, languages of power better, have access to upward mobility, have access to the power dynamics. And it is class-based, too, you know. Like, if your parents went to you know, a prestigious school, chances are you went there too, right? Um, so in one way, language does serve the function of, of uh, as a tool for upward mobility, and there is nothing wrong with that. I mean, you can use it to get what you want in life. The question is, can you use it effectively but still maintain a certain degree of humility a certain degree of egalitarian attitude about others, about people, you know, who if you have a prejudiced view, you might consider your inferiors. Uh, okay, so George Jacobs, what about highlighting the many advantages of being multilingual? Absolutely, I speak seven languages. Uh, so there is nothing wrong with that. I think it enables you to work with different cultures. So uh, for me, sorry, I always take it for granted that that's a good thing. Uh, and uh, 
if you work in the field of humanities, then it's like, it's the kind of wealth that not many people have. And that's one problem our students have here. You know, most of the times they just speak English, right? Uh, now, I mean, Spanish is taking some shape. Uh, but absolutely, if you speak more than one language, if you're multilingual, that doesn't just help you professionally. It also re rewires your brain differently, right? Because with with a new language comes the traces of its cultural culture, its literature, and all. Children are linguistically raised in English in the bourgeois education system, particularly Punjab. Thus, essentializing nativity for them can become more of a turbulence. Doesn't change have to be systemic more than individual merely. Obviously, change always comes when you change the system. But there is a problem with that mode of thinking. I mean, I'm a systems person, you know. If you ever ask me what my mission is, it's to change the world. But I can't wait for the ideal conditions to change the world. So that means that you work where you are in your individual capacity. You build solidarities with other like-minded people. Uh, you make a group of teachers who believe in certain things, and then you expand from there. The change will be systematic if more people work in solidarity to change things. But we cannot wait until that time, because systemic changes, you know, sometimes they don't even come about. But if you build several constituencies here, Lahore, Faisalabad, working on these issues, talking to each other, writing articles, walking in the streets, right? Then you, you have already built communities that eventually have enough clout, cultural and political, to affect minor changes and maybe bigger changes later, right? And that's when you change the system. <laughs> Obviously, I don't know the answer to that, but this doesn't apply to East Punjab. This is just the peculiarly Pakistani Punjab. The East Punjabis, Amritsar, wherever you run into them, even now when I run into them, we always speak in Punjabi, okay? And these are, you know, I'm talking about people like who are doctors of literature and all, you know. I think in Pakistani Punjab, and it doesn't apply a lot to South Punjab as well, because Siraiki people love to speak Siraiki and talk in it. Majority of them, I'm generalizing, of course, but this is based on my interactions with people. But I think the, the middle class, the Punjabi middle class, developed somehow this idea that, that their children, they need to speak Urdu. When we were growing up, it used to be Urdu. But later, now I think it's even gone higher, and it's now English. We take pride in it. And... I don't know. I think it's a class-based way of thinking, the role of language. Uh, but you can correct me if I'm wrong, because, you know, um, if you go to rural parts of Faisalabad, and I am from, from Gujar Khan, so, like, we speak Putwari, right? Uh, people have no problem with it. But as you move upward in the class structure, you will see that more traceable in Pakistan. The The... The Pathans, you know, I love KPK. Um, I just think that as a culture, linguistic culture, um, I don't know. I think they are more resilient, and uh, they never gave up on their script. Uh, when we were growing up, no Punjabi was taught in our government schools. But in KPK schools, you know, you learn Pashto. I mean, I still remember the first one poem that I had to memorize was Ragle Awai Jaz, Ragle Awai Jaz, Daga Pere Darizamung, Daga Choki Darizamung. We like sing that, right? So, so language in Sindh, Sindhi is still taught in the schools, rural and urban schools. Um, I'm not sure about Bravi and Balochi, whether it's taught or not. So part of it is that they kept the language as part of their curriculum. The tragedy of Punjabi is that it first got, got bifurcated into the Shah Mukhi script and, and the actual Gormukhi script. 
none of us learned the Gormukhi script, right? We only know the, the Persianized script. And so it becomes harder to teach it, right? Uh, whereas if you go to the other side of the border, of course, people learn Gormukhi, they write it, write in it, and they take pride in speaking, speaking it. So maybe it's also curriculum. We never developed the Punjabi curriculum. Uh, and now, of course, I don't even know if Punjabi is taught in government schools in Punjab. Okay, so, I mean, you're taking me into the debates of nationalism, which is part of my expertise. Uh, so think of it this way. If you go by, let's say, Ernest Gilner, right? And uh, I'm going there because he talks about a national high culture, right? So in Gellner's explanation of rise of nationalism and then eventual formation of the national states, uh, the idea is that a nation must develop a national high culture so that others aspire to be a part of it. And that is what creates that loyalty. But he doesn't propose that in the process of doing that, you should obliterate other regional and ethnic identities. So for me, the idea of a nation is you can have a thousand different ethnicities and languages, and then you can still build a national high culture where it doesn't matter what your language is. Remember, Hindi, only like about 45% people in India speak Hindi. If you go anywhere in the South, most people speak their own regional languages. But does anyone not consider themselves a, a Hindustani or, or a person from Bharat? No, they do. Because there is something larger than regional identities called India with a constitution, with 72 years of uninterrupted democracy, right? With, the, with a lot of problems and ethnic and other problems, I'm not denying that. So I don't think so that we need to have one single language to develop a national identity, right? You can have multiple languages, many cultures, many ethnicities, and then build a national high culture, right? And this is a very complex debate because why are nations failing in creating that kind of high culture is, is deeply connected to how the global economy works. Uh, that's why if you look anywhere, Pakistan, India, United States, since they can't so solve our economic problems, since they can't give us good salaries and good health care, so to main kiske piche lagaya hota hai inhone oh falana ne corruption ki thi ohde piche lag jao falana wabi hai ohde piche lag jao falana suni hai so they just give us these social issues women are not covering themselves adon ko uske piche laga do because social issues when you when you ask people to focus on those it doesn't cost anything it doesn't take a single penny to tell people say your prayers five times a day and, and tell your women to stay at home but if you want to build an egalitarian society in which women have equal access to education and everyone has access to health care, that takes money, money that these people don't have. So increasingly then there is this idea that if we could flatten the ethnocultures or ethnic identities, we can somehow build a national identity. That will fail. This single national curriculum is not going to build the Pakistan as you imagine. It's actually going to heighten the reactionary responses to a federal mandate. I mean, you can't go to Sindh and tell Sindhis, you know, don't speak your language, don't teach it. Why would you go there and tell them? It's a richer language in so many ways than Urdu, right? Uh, if you want to read the best of the leftist writing in Pakistan, it's all in Sindhi, right? Uh, so that's like my rough answer to your question. Uh, but someday if we meet, we, I would love to talk about nationalism. <laughs>